Uh, good evening, friends. Welcome to Tuesday's Masterclass webinar sessions from the Department of Critical Care Medicine from Ashoda Hospitals in collaboration with Hyderabad ISCCM chapter. So these sessions uh, bring forth uh, very good academic topics which are helpful across all the spectrum of critical care students like uh, DRNB, IDCCM, even uh, the DM candidates. So uh, for this uh, class, we are having uh, two uh, seasoned and uh, academy well-known well academicians. I welcome Dr. Ramachandran Gopinath, sir. <clears throat> he is the uh, head of the department of ESIC Medical College, uh, Sisha and Indian Suke, Hyderabad. Sir is a well-known figure uh, across uh, twin states and is a very well-known academician and ex-HOD of uh, NIMS. Uh, I welcome you on board, sir. We are privileged to have you on our uh, platform, Gopinath, sir. Thank you. And uh, I welcome uh, my close friend, uh, Dr. Niranjan, he is a senior consultant of critical care medicine from Apollo Hospitals, Hyderabad. Uh, he's a very motivated academician, well known, uh, speaks across the national uh, platforms. Uh, welcome, Dr. Niranjan. Thank you, Dr. Kaladar. Thank you so much. So, the, today's uh, topic of discussion is uh, ACS cardiogenic shock. For this, we are having uh, two students, uh, Dr. Madhurima and Dr. Tanuja. They both present the case. So while going through the case, uh, you can uh, you, you, feel, uh, you can uh, in between ask the questions and lead them. Uh, Dr. Madhurima and Dr. Tanuja, please uh, proceed presenting your case. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, sir. Um, today we are presenting the acute coronary syndrome case. Um, coming to the case presentation, chief complaints, 58-year male patient presented to outside hospital with complaining of chest pain associated with sweating and giddiness since two hours. Coming to the history of present illness, chest pain is retrosternal nature and radiating to left arm and associated with sweating and giddiness not associated with palpitations and SOB, not associated with nausea and vomiting. Course in the outside hospital. Initially, patient went to nearby hospital. Patient was conscious, coherent that time. BP was 11070 and pulse rate is 63 beats per minute. Respiratory rate 18 per minute. SpO2 is 98% on room air. An evaluation, ECG suggestive of uh, ST elevations in the 2-3 AVF, mostly it's suggestive of uh, inferior wall MI. So, Madhima, sir, sir. if you did not have an ECG and just the vitals, yes, sir. what would you think? You would still come, what would your diagnosis be or different? ECG. Sir. ECG, sir? If you did not have the ECG, yes, sir. you are still suspecting a coronary event. Yes. So, what would your findings suggest uh, in terms of territory involved? Bradycardia is so it can be inferior in volume, in suggestive of inferior volume. In we don't say inferior, we say right coronary. Right yes, right yes, so, that's a very important uh, finding that you have brought out. Yes, Patients with uh, right-sided coronary territory involvement always present. You said no palpitations, yes, so sir. heart rate of 63. 63. That's the trigger of suspicions, okay? Because that is very important in management. We'll talk about it. Carry on. In outside hospital, they given loading dose of aspirin 325 mg and clopidogrel 300 mg and atorvastatin 80 mg was given. And recent investigations, uh, those are tropi is 1.5 nanogram per ml and uh, hemoglobin is 14.9 grams per dl. Total count is 7039 cells and platelet is 2.8 lakhs and serum creatinine is 0 0.8 milligrams per dl and potassium is 4.9 milliequivalents per liter and serology 
is uh, non reactive so after reviewing the initial investigations patient was thrombolyzed within 30 minutes after arrival of the hospital with ready place 10 units iv bolus followed by 10 units iv 30 minutes apart in view so of what the, your options you have sir can you, can you just explain the ecg to us please can yes, you read sir. that ecg for us previous uh, one or uh, this one sir previous. either of them. you can start what with the previous you can start with basis, the previous ecg on what basis did they start uh, you know thrombolytic yes sir uh, this ECG is showing a sinus rhythm with a heart rate of 63, 63 beats per minute okay. and uh, uh, ST elevations are present in the 2-3 AVF and also ST depressions in the v, v1, v1, v1 and V2. Okay. So what do you understand by party sign? Have you heard of party sign? ST segment elevation with the convex oh. upwards. So hyperacute ST elevations are called party sign. Right. Okay. Very much. So Dr. Madhurima, yes. so uh, can can you go, go back to your previous slides? So with these symptoms and with this history, uh, so uh, so imagine this patient was there with uh, in your team or came to your ED. So how do you approach? Uh, patient is patient having retrosternal pain. It is uh, mostly suggestive of uh, acute uh, myocardial infarction, sir. High probability of myocardial infarction, and and it is also radiating to left arm. So, uh, my initial approach is towards uh, airway breathing, airway breathing circulation. circulation, and then we have to send the initial investigations. Uh, like CBP, RFT, and uh, ECG, tropi, and then we will proceed with uh, if the uh, initially patient went to non PCI center cell. So that's why a patient was thrombolyzed. It is uh, distance from PCI center uh, around four hours distance. Okay, that that we will discuss later. Mm -hmm. So uh, so if a patient uh, with chest pain. Uh, comes to you within two hours. Do you really send CBC, RP to something something else? Also, you told. So what? Uh, what? Uh, so uh, like what? What are your DDs there? What or what are the disease you would like to uh, uh, rule out here? Chest pain, sir. Chest pain and SOB can be because of cardiac or extra cardiac causes, sir. Cardiac causes uh, acute myocardial infarction, aortic right. dissection. Mm, pericarditis, yeah. myocarditis, uh, and extracardiac causes, uh, um, pulmonary, it can be pneumonia, pulmonary thromboembolism, um, pleural massive pleural effusion, um, and uh, in intra-abdominal, it can be pancreatitis, cholecystitis, uh, it can be esophageal causes like esophageal spasm and GERD. So what made you, what made you think straight you told it's a uh, MI? So there are clincher here. How did you rule out so many things? There are so many life-threatening situations are there. So if you miss a dissection or if you miss a pneumothorax or a pulmonary embolism, they can exactly mimic as a coming to you uh, with chest pain. Then how did you straight? Uh, how do you straight go to ECG? In IOT dissection, mm -hmm. there is a sharp pain, tearing pain, and radiating to back, sir, and pulse variation will be there. And uh, pneumothorax, pneumothorax will be breath sounds. Here, breath sounds the hypotension will be there, sir. Dyspnea. Here, there is no dyspnea and hypotension. And normal vascular breath sounds are there. there. Okay. So, patient coming to you with chest pain. Okay. So, common causes are common. But there are life-threatening, uncommon causes. If you miss that thing, you are going to lose a patient. Okay. Fine. So, we understood. So, now, uh, uh, the question is, so is there any timeline, time frame you should do ECG? Yes, ECG uh, interpretation within 10 minutes. 10 minutes from what? Do, do ECG do interpretation, interpretation within 10 minutes. Whose door? Patient's door? Patient's door. Hospital. Patient. 
hospital arrival hospital arrival within 10 minutes so it's your ed door to ecg reading okay fine yeah you can go ahead when do you expect your biomarkers to be I mean there would be a panel i guess every emergency department would uh, have a panel to rule out uh, various uh, you know acute uh, causes for chest pain so what would you be looking at in terms of ruling out or early biomarkers and when do you expect them to show up positive if uh, a patient uh... came with the uh, chest pain we have to send the uh, high sensitivity tropi uh, if it is low um, we have to uh, rule out the mi and uh, if it is in high and uh, it increased with the zero, one hour and two hour it will be most probably acute mi and it is the ruling criteria, criteria sir. and any other markers Which are the, can you tell us what all markers go at at various timelines? <clears throat> Myoglobin, uh, CKMB, tropi and tropsy, and uh, LDH and newer biomarkers like uh, HFRP and uh, IMA, copeptin, copeptin. That might not be available in all emergency departments unless it's a center dealing with all uh, you know all kind of uh, patients. So okay. go ahead. How would you how would you initially stabilize this patient? First, stabilize with the APC sir, airway breathing and circulation, and then um, loading dose with the uh, antiplatelets, dual antiplatelets, and uh, um, if a patient is on thrombolysis or PCA, direct PCA. depending on the depending center, on the center and uh, depending on the patient uh, condition mm -hmm. so what if the patient was in shock in by straight away invasive intervention should be done okay. if the patient is in pci available center directly pci primary pci should be done okay carry on and okay. what should you what should you do if it's a non pci capable center And patient presented you with a diagnosis of MI and shock. Then, um, if shock is there, we have. Uh, if PCA center is uh, more than one twenty minutes, uh, from less than one twenty minutes, and shift the patient. Shift the patient. This patient presented two hours of history, isn't it? Yes, sir. So you think there was a window period for PCA or uh, only for thrombolysis? PCA, When you say door to balloon, is it at any point of time after the onset of chest pain, or is it within a few hours? How is it? Door, how does it work? Door, door to balloon, balloon is within ninety minutes. minutes. No, that's that's arrival after arrival in the hospital. Isn't it? What if the patient had chest pain for one one day? Okay. Anyway, yes. carry on. So, you, Doctor Nirajan asked you, how do you stabilize this patient or manage this patient? If he had shock or not non PCI center, what are the problems of giving thrombolysis? Hmm. First, you have to uh, assess the patient is uh, uh, indicated for thrombolysis or not, sir, and then we have to proceed with thrombolysis. If shock is there, uh, have to rule out uh, uh, the MI type means inferior wall MI or uh, differentiate the MI and uh, give if if it is uh, inferior wall MI, you have to give the fluids and then stabilize the patient. If it is indicated for thrombolysis, we we should do we should start th um, thrombolysis Thrombolysis. and then send the patient to. If it's inferior wall MI, you said you give fluids. Yes, sir. Okay. And what is the physiological basis for that, please? Involvement um, preload dependent, preload dependent. dependent right ventricle yeah. involved and right ventricular contractility will be will be low in uh, inferior valve MI because of RCA involvement. 
so we mm-hmm. have to give them fluids in inferior wall mri yes so what you you are familiar with uh, guyton's curves right you have heard of guyton's curve yes. Yes. venous return yes this venous return maximum systemic filling pressure minus cvp mm-hmm. by venous resistance okay. so you need to you have to understand the physiology of preload dependent ventricle that is the right ventricle when it is having ischemia or infarcted okay. so the other other name you need to be familiar with is the bellamy curve so please read up okay. so because it's very important to understand how the right ventricle when it fails or is infarcted differs from the left ventricle so bellamy curve and guyton curves you should be so guyton curve is about venous return mm-hmm. bellamy curve is about organ perfusion pressure okay okay so that the right ventricular output is equal to the left ventricular input mm-hmm. so that is something that you need to maintain otherwise stroke volume so yes. this is only cardiogenic shock where you fill up a patient only yes. the only patient with the right sided infarct is if they are the only cardiogenic shock patients where you fill them up okay so monitoring would be important we'll talk about it. go ahead yes. mm-hmm. in view of the persistent ep- epigastric discomfort the patient was shifted to ashoda hospital for further management on arrival in er patient was conscious and coherent moderate uh, he was moderately built and nourished and uh, febrile vitals are 11070 heart rate is 74 per minute respiratory rate is 18 per minute spo2 is 100% on room air grbs is 109 mg per dl and uh, patient was shifted to iccu for further management in a uh, course in the iccu uh, day day one uh, a compl- uh, patient was still complaining of epigastric discomfort uh, he is conscious and coherent on examination Uh, cvs is s1 s2 present and uh, apex beat at the left fifth intercostal space mid clavicular line and jvp is not raised and respiratory rate sy- respiratory system bilateral normal vascular breath sounds are present parabdomen is soft and no organomegaly cns is normal there is no alter sensory and neurological so, so dr madhuri ma so uh, this patient oh, can you go back to the slide the previous slide so then what went wrong this patient got a uh, thrombolytics went there within the window period then uh, what happened why why the uh, persistent uh, the chest pain was there can you explain what might be the cause patient came to the our er so what do you think Wh- or what went wrong pain thrombolysis pardon pain thrombolysis okay so can you can you uh, define what is failed thrombolysis uh, less less than 50% resolution of ht segment uh, elevations in 60 to 90 minutes after 60 to 90 minutes of thrombolysis so can you go back to those uh, ecgs can you tell us the difference between the first one at arrival and the second one after thrombolysis um initially it initially ecgs so in Yeah, there are ECGs of a particular patient after the described events that you have said? Yes, yes sir. sir. This is after thrombolysis, sir. Okay. After thrombolysis, so the... initially, initially it was uh, 2, 3 AVF ST elevations and uh, V1, V2 ST depressions are there, sir. After thrombolysis, uh, T-wave inversions are there in uh, 2, 3 AVF yes. and uh, V5, V6. what about the st is that you described as failed thrombolysis initially is that there st segment elevation was initially 3 mm sir now it is 2 mm st segment elevation is still persisting so does that tell you any story yes sir it is possibly a failed thrombosis failed thrombolysis so that should be a see persistent retrosternal pain became epigastric yes maybe retrosternal and then it became persistent epigastric pain then discomfort if you want to say so if you have seen those two ecgs that should that should trigger off that yes this patient is probably 
thrombolysis has not been successful or failed. Failed. Yes. Don't say failed thrombolysis or partial thrombolysis. So maybe it's not fully recon. Okay, so mm -hmm. that should be your telltale sign of something not right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. So ideally, what is the success rate of uh, uh, TPA? So got TPA, I believe. Retiplase, yes. So, hmm. so what is so uh, uh what is the success rate of uh, streptokinase and success rate of TPA or retiplase? Streptokinase it is sixty percent, sir. Retiplase it is uh, timi three timi three flow is around seventy percent with retiplase. Timi three flow. Hmm. Yeah. So. so yeah, septokine is around 65 and around 75 percent is the TPA. Yes, sir. Okay. And can you tell me what are the predictors of success or in which group of patients you will predict that, okay, these patients may fail even after giving a thrombolysis? Are there any predictors or which subset of patients they usually fail to respond? Yes. Large, large in fox cells and okay, okay. Mm -hmm. There is a timeline. One, one. There is a timeline because the thrombos get matured over time. Thirty okay. minutes. Not thirty minutes. Maximum two hours, sir. Maximum benefit within two hours. Up to twelve hours. Okay, thrombolysis can be done up to twelve hours, but maximum benefit can be got up to three to four hours. Yeah. Okay. So time. Second is the uh vessel okay if it is a bigger a thrombus then there is a more possibility then how do you know so uh ki thrombus is bigger or smaller is there any way to uh, uh like localize the thrombus yes okay. apart apart from the territory Tell me ECG yes if it is uh, like yes. uh, if it is a proximal LAD, so usually, or if it is a left main, yes. they supply the major part of the myocardium, maybe somewhere so around 60 to 70 percent. If it is a proximal or the left main, okay. So, uh, they usually they are the patients they are going to fail to thrombolysis and patient in shock. So, their perfusion uh, will not happen properly, and usually they also may fail to respond to your thrombolysis, okay. Yeah, go ahead. In past history, uh, no, no history of similar complaints in the past and uh, nil comorbidities he had. And uh, personal history, patient is chronic smoker and alcoholic, stopped five years back. And family history, no history of similar complaints in the family. This is the ECG uh, um, in ICCU. Uh, ECG showing uh, sinus rhythm with the uh, heart rate of uh, 62 per minute and uh, um, ECG showing 2-3 AVF of T-wave inversions and V5, V6 also T-wave inversions are there. And, when do we uh, consider uh, pacing in these patients? Uh, if there is any uh, complete heart block or second degree or complete heart block, move it type okay. Mobits type to second degree heart block and uh, a complete okay. heart block we have to plan and patient was hemodynamic and unstable. So you should always consider transvenous pacing as a you know, standby in these patients. So you must have facility for that or at least trans thoracic. Okay. Yeah. And we send the uh, coagulation profile like PT. APTT and PT is 14.1 and APTT 28.8. INR is 1.02. Today, echo showing inferior wall regional, regional wall motion abnormality. Hypokinesia is there. EF is 50% and mild LV dysfunction. No valvular abnormalities. Do and you expect any changes in coagulation parameters with loading doses of uh, drugs, antiplatelets? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, anti-platelets will 
no, no changes that we didn't have any anticoagulation but how do you know they are working would you have any facility which would help you to know how many are responders to clopidogrel please what is the rate how many patients are responders and how many are non responders 22 to 30% of population they might be not responders sir actually clopidogrel is a pro drug which is metabolized by hepatic cytochrome p450 into active drug mm -hmm. so 20 to 30% of population they can have abnormalities in cytochrome p450 okay so what would be an alternative to that uh, ticagrelor, ticagrelor, which is a, it is not a product. It, it bypasses the hepatic. It is not hepatic, but yeah. activation is not required. So, so pharmacogenetics, pharmacogenetics will determine what. So we don't know. So is there any way you could make out, or uh, you know, if you had a point of care testing? Take. Yeah. So take. either rot rotem or teg might be helpful in these patients. Because one of the things that you have to understand in failed thrombolysis is again about whether <clears throat> these patients are responders or non-responders also. Okay. Yeah, carry on. Dr. Madhurima, yeah. One. Yeah, regarding the ECG changes, uh, can you elaborate like uh, what are the different uh, types of uh, ACS uh, that you, uh, what are the types of ECG changes that you observe, like the inferior volume MI, anterior volume MI? Can you tell uh, what are the changes that you see? Okay. If... Uh... In inferior volume, my RCA is usually involved. ST segment elevations will be there in 2, 3 AVF and uh, reciprocal depressions will be there in lead 1 and AVL. Um, inferior volume my can be because of uh, RCA or LCX. If ST segment depressions in lead 3 is more than lead 2, uh, ST segment elevation lead 3 is more than lead 2 and in uh, ST segment depression in AVL mo more than lead 1, it is suggestive of RCA is occluded. Um, uh, coming to uh, LMCA, left main coronary artery, uh, ST segment elevations will be there from V1 to V6 and the reciprocal depressions will be there in 2, 3 AVF. Uh, and uh, coming to LAD, proximal LAD and distal LAD. Um, in proximal LAD, um, V1 to V6, V6 ST elevations will be there. And uh, in distal LAD, V1 to V6 uh, ST elevations plus or minus 2, 3 AVF elevations, elevations will be there. Sir. And posterior wall MI, uh, it may be associated with inferior wall MI uh, mm -hmm. and uh, RC and LCX. And uh, gold standing is uh, posterior leads with V7 to V9. Mm -hmm. And also V1, V2 uh, RS ratio more than 1. It's suggestive of posterior wall Yes. Lateral, volume, lateral volume can be because of uh, LCX or LAD occlusion, sir. If it is uh, uh, okay, how about uh, if a patient having LPVB and the pacemaker, how do you diagnose uh, uh, the stabilization in mind these patients or otherwise acute coronary syndrome? Mm -hmm. Uh, criterion, sir. In LBB yeah. with the uh, ST elevation more than one mm with concordant QRS complex. Uh, it's suggestive of five points and uh, ST depression more than one mm and V1, V2, V3 is suggestive of uh, three, three, three points. points and uh, ST segment elevation more than five mm with discordant uh, QRS complexes. It's suggestive of two points. If the score is more than three, 98% uh, of the patients will have the acute end. Yeah. So it's very important you read an ECG properly in a patient who suspected uh, coronary syndromes so that you can act accurately because the territory at risk is what determines how you manage these patients in the immediate uh, after post event. Carry on, please. Yeah. Uh, patient was uh, shifted to cath lab after giving the tigogrelal 180 mg and injection and fraction heparin 5000. So, Dr. Tanoja, so uh, why you have ordered 5000 unit heparin? In normally 60 units per kg loading dose. No, I'm not asking the dose. I'm asking the resonal heparin in MI patient. 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 <coughs> Anticoagulation should be given to. Should it, do you use uh, 
like routinely for all patients or in specific subset of patient it should be used routinely what is this role if you are using routinely there must be a reason isn't it yes uh -huh. this is for P pci only if if a if a non pci patient then would he be getting heparin clopidogrel when so then they have, what what is the reason why you are giving only at, when you have an intervention in place um yeah, distal to um uh, to prevent uh, distal embolization and uh, re thrombi. What can cause thrombi when you are doing an intervention? Thrombus, thrombus can be dislodged distally. That is mechanical event, no? Yes. What are you putting? Guide wires, catheters, <clears throat> are all, can all of them cause have a thrombogenicity? Yes, <laughs> endothelization. Thrombus will prevent with the uh, infraction of that. Okay. So, yeah, if you are going for PCI, so heparin is not a, uh, it should not be a routine, but if it is like a large enteroval MI, or if it is, uh, or if there is a proven LB clot, ideally in those patients, heparin should be given. Some patients, some cardiologists, I uh, miss, they prefer to give heparin. But it's again the recommendation says it's it's not a it should not be routine. Your patient was a post thrombolysis patient, so uh, my concern was already got full dose of thrombolysis. Immediately came to us and got five thousand unit heparin. That too we are going for a PCI, yes. so uh, that was my concern. <clears throat> Generally, uh, cardiologists do prefer. Uh... Heparin, even if they are fully thrombolyzed, <clears throat> because the pathways are different. You know, one is a fibrolytic, and uh, you know, the other is to prevent a thrombus in, mm -hmm. to happen again because that process is still on. So, generally, the concerns are when these patients post thrombolysis, post PCI come for surgery, they bleed like pigs. But otherwise, uh, low dose. Uh, Heparin is not, uh, at least in the older generation of cardiologists, yes, they do. Yes, sir. Yeah, you can go ahead. Mm -hmm. After the uh, coronary angiogram was done, it was uh, suggestive of double vessel disease. RCA uh, occluded 90% uh, stenosis and LAD 70% stenosis. Um, PTCA done to RCA and LAD with drug eluting stent through the right radial artery uh, and shifted back to ICC. Yeah, this is the post PTCA ACC. It's showing uh, um, normal sinus rhythm with the heart rate of uh, 64 and uh, 2 3 AVF. And uh, V5, V6 uh, T wave inversion surveys. So, so uh, Dr. Madhuri, ma, so uh, like our patient had an inferior MI, and incidentally, we found there is a left anterior block. So, what the study says target vessel uh, stenting versus multi vessel stenting? Culprit trial, sir. Culprit vessel stenting versus multi vessel stenting. Culprit vessel stunting should be done first, sir. If uh, low risk of patients and uh, low complexity of lesion is there, then we can do multi vessel PCA also. Otherwise, first we should do only cul culprit vessel PCA and followed by staged PCA. Yes. So uh, imagine your patient, uh, had your patient been in shock, so ideally you will not get that much time. So in those cases, they've studied culprit vessel. Uh, so the study is. Uh, culprit shock. Culprit shock. So the culprit, you go immediately. So urgently, uh, stent the culprit vessel and come back. So that is the thing. Because maybe your patient was hemodynamically stable. That's the reason they would have planned to do a, uh, yeah, stenting of both the vessels. Yes. Okay. So depending on the patient's clinical status, you either address 
just the culprit vessel or if any other vessel which is accessible and can cause an area of risk at risk or larger area at risk, especially on the other side. So generally, if the patient is hemodynamically unstable, it is just the culprit vessel, stabilize and then take him back again. What if this patient had comorbidities like long-standing diabetes? In, in diabetic patients, most preferably, PCA is preferable, sir. Okay. To prevent uh, sternal wound injury, uncontrolled diabetics. Yeah. Yeah, PCA, PCA is preferable, sir. So when there are two discrete lesions or type 1 lesions, yes, you can uh, <clears throat> do stenting or PCI. Okay. But if they are diffuse or type 3, then they would probably okay. not be candidates except for the culprit person. Okay. So there would be probably a hybrid procedure. So you said if this patient was hemodynamically unstable, so how would you manage... Uh, hemodynamic instability in these patients? What would your monitoring like to be? What would you like to monitor in terms of invasive monitoring and pharmacological management? No, invasive monitoring, patient is unstable means uh, intra-arterial uh, Art arterial arterial monitoring and the cardiac output monitoring, hemodynamic monitoring like CVP, we should first to see what is the cause of shock, sir. Mm -hmm. Cause of that echocardiography, isn't it? Oh, yes, yes. Sir. Cause of uh, hemodynamic instability. Immediately, mm -hmm. echo should be uh, done. Uh, immediately, post procedure PTCA. If there is any shock, it can be because of a pericardial tamponade. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, procedural complications or uh, acute MI complications will be there. First, you have to rule out from mechanical complications to right mechanical um, free wall rupture ventricular septal rupture papillary muscle dysfunction causing uh, acute severe mr yes so you should also rule out all other causes okay. that could be probably resulting in low cardiac output state yes sir. so how would you manage low cardiac output state in a patient who had acs Maybe thrombolize following PTCA. PTCA. Left ventricular assist devices. No, pharmacological first or the circulatory assist? Pharmacological. Yes. So what, what would you prefer in these patients? <clears throat> Normally, uh, noradrenaline is preferable yes. drugs. Okay. Noradrenaline and uh, dopamine, both are preferable, sir. Uh, both are indicated, but uh, comparatively, noradrenaline is preferred drugs. Okay. Why not dobutamine? Dobutamine, if the patient is hemodynamically unstable, BP, uh, we will start dopamine with uh, with at least BP of 90 mm, systolic BP of 90 mm of HG. So, Okay. In hemodynamical unstable, norad is the first preferred drug. So, norepinephrine or vaso vaso vasopressors are preferred to I any know. other inotrope or inotropic. Yes. Okay. So, any if this if these don't help, what could you do? INVP or uh, left ventricular assisted devices, LVAD and RVADs. Okay. So. Any role for ECMO in these patients? If there is any refractory hypertension not relieved with the IABP and uh, LVAD, we'll go with no arterial ECMO. We know arterial ECMO last. Which is, which is quicker, putting an LVAD in place or say no, or uh, putting an IABP or putting them on ECMO? Which is which is which is quicker? IABP is quicker. IABP is IABP supports LV, RV. 
Are you happy to maintain the coronary circulation, sir? Generally, when we say circulatory support, generally when we say circulatory support, what yes, would sir. you what would you be sir, supporting the left side or the right side? Left side. Yes. yes. So generally, if you are talking about low cardiac output, the low cardiac output is related to the left ventricle or systemic pressure. So LVAD and unless you have defined the failed ventricle, then you use an appropriate, you know, right RVAD or LVAD or BIVAD. But in the meanwhile, first thing would be the immediate ones would be either an IABP if it is available and uh, it's a cardiac center, obviously. So then obviously you can look at either an ECMO or depending on availability or the expertise to place uh, <clears throat> LVAD or uh, RVAD. Mm -hmm. This patient say, suppose had a cardiac arrest. Yes. How do you manage this patient? He say pre 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 PCI after he arrived from the outside center failed thrombolysis in the ICU. Emergency PCI should be done, sir. Mm -hmm. Cardiac Yes. So you you do CPR and. Yes, sir. After, after resuscitation, after initial resuscitation, we will do emergency PCI, sir. With the yes. CPR. So, with... what is the concept of eCPR then? Would this patient be an ideal candidate for an eCPR? Yes, sir. Yeah. So, because, see, at least in sent wherever these are available, that should be the first before taking him or see, take him in, into the, uh, into the uh, cath lab. So you can always establish, get some amount of stability and then subject him to PCI. So these are all known things. So angiography can be done after the once the patient is on ECMO. All right. Yes. Patient has received contrast, isn't it? Yes, sir. So what if this patient developed contrast-induced nephropathy also? How would you manage these patients? How do you define CIN? Prevention. Mm -hmm. These are all possibilities, isn't it? Yes, yes sir. Contrast-induced. Should mind, you should, uh, tell us. We should take measures to prevent contrast-induced nephropathy, adequate... Uh, Hydration and low dose of low volume of contrast should be used and high intensity statins and uh, preferably radial artery access should be used. These, these are the four approaches to prevent the contrast induced nephropathy. And if the patient is planned for uh, CABC, we will wait for uh, at least 24 hours. 24 hours is enough? Ma maximum seven, seven days, seven sir, days. but uh, at least so 24 at least. hours you have to wait. Sure. So, five days is what is recommended for surgery. But yes, you should. How will you manage once nephropathy occurs? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Normally, there is proven. There is no proven drug to manage a, a contrast in this nephropathy, sir. But uh, NSTL system and uh, high dose statins and uh, renal replacement therapy if needed. In. Okay, so always bear in mind that patients who receive contrast can always develop nephropathy and you should always be serious about taking care that it doesn't happen, like she said, preventive measures. So hydrostatins generally are very helpful. Yes. Anastalcystine, questionable efficacy, yes. but uh, good hydration. Yes. So that is something. And if it does happen, obviously you have to support uh, the kidney. Whatever. Yes. Okay. Tell us. Is that the last slide? Yes. Post procedure, uh, patient developed hypo hypotension. So we started on noradrenaline. And oh, after uh, 
two hours of infusion, patient was recovered slowly. And then post-procedure ECG was uh, suggestive of 2-3 AVF and V5, V6 T-wave inversions. And uh, day two patient was conscious. Dr. Dr. Madhurina, stay, stay, can you stay back in the previous slide? So post-stenting, uh, so your patient came to recovery. Right now, patient had hypotension. So what are the things you would like to rule out here? During, pro during procedure, what I felt, patient's uh, vitals were stable. Yes, yes sir. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. So immediately after stenting, patient developed hypotension. Causes? Pericardial, pericardial tamponade or any mechanical complications of MI, like yes. any free wall rupture. Oh. ventricular septal rupture or papillary muscle dysfunction mm. any dehydration have you heard stent sir stent thrombosis stent thrombosis stent thrombosis how soon does stent restenosis happen or stent thrombosis occur that often sir Pardon? Sir, we did not. Uh, no, no. How, how soon do you suspect uh, restenosis or strength thrombus? In, immediately. Immediately. With, immediately? Within one hour. And how do you recognize that? Non resolution of uh, ECG changes. And, and hemodynamic instability persisting. Primary is hemodynamic uh, okay. instability. Okay. This is all symptoms of poor perfusion of the target area or <coughs> myocardium. Right. Yes, so sir. you should suspect uh, instant thrombosis despite all this. This is why we say non responders. So it's, it's less with uh, ticaglural now, but. Uh, when clopidogrel was there, there was a higher incidence. So obviously, you have uh, better uh, coated stents now. But even then, that should still stick to your mind very, you know, come up very quickly. Because post stenosis or post re 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 and revascularization, you should not have uh, persistent hypotension like this patient. Had. Yes, he sort of you know, responded to norepinephrine uh, within a couple of hours and became better. All right. Mechanical complications, yes. And how do you rule out all of those that you said? You said... Uh, yes. So, these patients should be subjected to an echocardiography and afterwards to see if the myocardial regional wall motion abnormalities have improved. Right? Yes. That's something that you should uh, be very good at. Okay? As soon as the patient arrives from the cath lab. Yeah. I see. Okay. So, uh, what are the types of MI that you have? Five types of MI. Uh, type, type 1 is a spontaneous uh, atherosclerotic uh, plague superimposed with the thrombus. Type 2 is because of uh, myocardial uh, demand supply mismatch. Type 3 is uh, MI without elevation of uh, cardiac biomarkers. Type 4, which includes 4A and 4B. 4A is because of uh, instant, uh, instant... Type 4A is... Uh, uh, Post, post, PCI. post PCI, 4B is uh, instant restenosis, type 5 is post. So, what are the like the, the spectrum of ACS? Uh, three types of them, right? non ST elevation, ST elevation MI, non ST elevation MI, and uh, unstable angina. In ST elevation MI, there will be ECG changes and uh, biomarkers will be elevated. In non ST elevation MI, ST segment non specific ST changes like ST segment and T wave depressions without biomarkers. In unstable with, with biomarkers, my... unstable angina, there will be no elevation of biomarkers. Yes. So, uh, this patient developed hypotension, as I was asking. Uh, suppose you want to give fluid, how do you proceed? How do you determine that this patient is uh, having a tough hypovolemia? And how do you proceed uh, giving the fluid therapy in patients of cardiogenic shock? So, what is the definition of cardiogenic shock, by the way? Hypotension and uh, elevated left ventricular pressure, organ, organ uh, um, 
end organ damage of uh, following two two or three signs hypotension less than sbp less than 90 uh, with 20 minutes with the uh, fluid resuscitation so, and so as pressure support and uh, pulmonary congestion and uh, pulmonary uh, wedge pressure will be more than 20 and with following uh, end organ decreased urine output altered uh, mental status and cold, cold clammy skin. skin and decreased urine output and low ejection fraction okay so uh, how do you proceed uh, regarding whether you give fluid or not we'll check the um, normally we check the ivc and the cardiac contractility um, uh, what in the context of right ventricular mi to the ivc IVC will be full, sir. Because uh, right ventricle contractility is impaired, so IVC will be full in right ventricle diastole. Okay. Yeah, then the, then it's a gray area. It's a bit difficult to uh, you follow with the IVC and give the fluid. So, uh, vasopressor should be... We should start on vasopressor in spite of giving more IV fluids. Clinically, basically, what you look at uh, whether the patient is having any crepes, if there is any decrease in saturation, whether this cardiogenic shock uh, leading to this left ventricular failure causing any pulmonary edema, whether you will give some fluid. Maybe initially, if the patient is hypotensive, may give a small bolus of around 200 to 50 ml and then look at what is happening clinically, whether the patient is having any development of pulmonary edema, decrease in saturation, breathlessness, new development of crepes. Look at lung ultrasound, any B profile is coming. So this is all a comprehensive uh, by looking at a patient in a comprehensive way. Probably uh, whether he is responding to fluid or not, we can generally check giving small fluid bolus and all. Uh, but if the patient is upfront, the patient already developed a severe uh, pulmonary edema and all, definitely they require diuretics rather than fluid. fluid. The cardiogenic shock. Patient so, is in pulmonary edema. Main treatment is with the diuretics and then I will. Yes. Yeah. Uh, what are the vas vasopressor of choice? You told, I think, Naradlin. What, uh, what about uh, will you use dop dopamine? Dopamine causes more uh, tachyarrhythmia, sir. Yes. So, uh, um, comparatively, noradrenaline is preferred. Yes. The role of IABP, sir, was asking uh, regarding uh, mechanical circulatory supports. Uh, what do you think? Uh, what is the study? Do you remember any study that uh, supports or refutes uh, the use of IABP? IABP study. How the IABP works? Uh, it improves the coronary perforation, sir, to improve the. Um, it mainly works by counter pulsation mechanism, sir. Okay. There will be uh, mm -hmm. be balloon filled with uh, helium mm -hmm. gas and it will be uh, inflated during the diastolic phase. So the blood will be pushed uh, towards the heart and coronary perforation occurs during diastole. Okay. And what else? And what else? Yeah. When it deflates, what does it do? It decreases the afterload. Yes, yeah, so it works both ways. Yes. So one is it's reducing afterload as well as improving the coronary, coronary perfusion. It is. It is a. It, it's a, It it was a lifesaver before LVADs or other circulatory devices came in. So it still has some role, <clears throat> especially in patients who are, you know, hypertensive or the LVS fail. So what do you understand by ischemia reperfusion injury? We are talking about a zone or area where there has been significant ischemia. Could that be a cause for hypotension? Mm -hmm. It can be yes. So you should always remember a patient who has had significant ischemia for a reasonable amount of time. <clears throat> when you revascularize, there is always a reperfusion injury. So this 
this is probably a little bit of stunning of the myocardium, which is why he recovered within a couple of hours, you see. Just support for a short while and he recovered uh, fully. So always bear in mind so many causes for hypotension. So you've ruled out mechanical, so physiological causes. These would be some physiological. <clears throat> and in, and of course, like we said, uh, instant thrombosis. So this should be in your mind. Any role for levosimandan in these patients who are now refractory, refractory hypotension or low cardiac output state? Levosimandan. Normal, normal LV function will give levosimandan. You yeah. give levosimandan when the LV function is normal, is it? Yes, yes sir. When normal LV function. Why do you need it when the LV function is normal? Sir, why do you need it? Why do you need a levosimandan when LV function is normal? What is levosimandan? Mm -hmm. what, what, where would you classify it in terms of pharmacotherapy for cardiogenic shock? Vasopressor, inotrope, inodilator. Inodilator. I know dilator. <clears throat> what does it dilate? How does it work, by the way? Yeah. Calcium sensitization, isn't it? It's a calcium sensitizer. It is one of the drugs kept reserved for patients who are in low cardiac output. Obviously, low cardiac output means EF is low. LV function is impaired, isn't it? Yes. All right. Yes. So there is a role you must always keep in mind. Yes, but it 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 it, it is with the availability of uh, mechanical support, supports, circulatory supports. Not many would, but yes, it is still a drug that can be used either with right side or with left sided dysfunction. Okay. So we have used it, uh, at least uh, I have in patients who have had uh, who are in the ICU with uh, good enough uh, results. That's that's different, but okay. So now this patient, if he developed some dysrhythmias, <clears throat> what would be a choice of anti What 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 are the types of dysrhythmias that you can expect in this patient? In this patient, mostly bradyarrhythmias are the most common. So, mm -hmm. bradyarrhythmias, uh, patient is um, hemodynamically stable. Atropine is the choice initially, and then will uh, uh, in uh, Mobit type two and uh, complete heart block. We will go with the pacemaker, temporary mm -hmm. pacemaking or complete pacemaking. We have uh, permanent. Yes, and. Post-ventricular fibrillation, it's still the same, only bradyarrhythmias? No, ventricular fibrillation can also. Ventricular yes. Fibrillation fibrillation there is bradyarrhythmias. Post-revascularization, you should expect tachydysrhythmias yes. also. Yes. All right. So, the importance of right-sided infarcts or right coronary being involved is that it can have a different spectrum of dysrhythmias before and after revascularization, so that you should be aware, including AF, <clears throat> right? So what would you use in those terms? What would be a drug of choice? Amiodarone. If uh, AF is there, amiodarone is the 150 milligrams of bolus okay. for rate and rhythm control, both will be managed okay. with amiodarone. Okay. If, if the rate is not controlled, what other choices do we have? Calcium, beta blockers. Beta blockers with somebody with. Uh, maybe, uh, yes, yes. Ribavirin is there, so you should consider ribavirin also in these patients. All right. So antidysrhythmics are a whole class of drugs you should be thorough about when you are managing patients with cardiac dysrhythm, cardiac dysfunction. All right. So any of these can happen. <clears throat> Also remember most uh, antidysrhythmics are prodysrhythmics. So that is something that you should keep in mind. All right. So this patient uh, 
post PTC, ECG, suggestive of no signs of 2, 3 AVF, V5, V6, T1. Okay. Now, what would this patient's, uh, if, if you had to do uh, serial investigations, what would you be doing for these patients in the ICU? RFP, serum creatinine. Okay. Serum, uh, so renal function. CBP, sir. Okay, CBP. Why? It, um, RFT it, and coagulation profile. CBP mainly total counts will if patient had any symptoms we have to rule out the any infective etiology like myocarditis and pericarditis. And in RFT to know the uh, creatinine in level and uh, contrast in induced nephropathy and coagulation mm -hmm. Already, already we have thrombolized and we have given heparin. So heparin, how does it? How long does it last? Action of heparin. Single bolus, you said, no? Yes. yes. Then any biomarkers would you do? Would they be useful in these patients? Do they have any CKM. prognostic view? CKM. CKM. Yeah. Does it have a prognostic value or it's a diagnostic value only? Diagnostic value. Yeah. So they are not much of use unless there is ongoing ischemia. <clears throat> so they would be elevated, but any dropping levels might not be. Okay. So any other slides? So last slide. Um, on day two, patient, uh, patient was conscious and coherent, symptomatically improved and hemodynamically stable uh, and discharged with the following drugs, uh, aspirin 75 mg OD, ticagrelal 90 mg BD and uh, atorvastatin 40 mg OD HS and ramipril 2.5 mg OD and pantoprazol 40 mg OD and patient was discharged. What is the role of ramipril here? You see inhibitors uh, to LV prevent the remodeling. Left over to remodel to improve the LV remodeling. Improve remodeling. How much is the year? Fifty percent. Okay, is that okay or why do why do you want remodeling? Is remodeling is a is a chronic process or an acute process? So, chronic chronic process. process. So does it have anything? Did this patient have any, say, hypertension or anything? No, no history, no? Mm -hmm. So what could be the role of ramipril in this case? What else does AC inhibitors do? What does it do to afterload? Because it's the afterload. Yeah. So low dose ramipril, that's a normal dose or low dose? Low dose. Low, low dose. dose. Okay. So one is that ramipril might be ACE inhibitor, might be of some benefit in terms of remodeling. We don't we don't unless it's a chronic process, you don't talk about the role of ACE inhibitors for remodeling. Okay. Yes. Say since you mentioned remodeling. Amongst all the cardiac drugs, <clears throat> you said beta blockers, you said calcium blockers, you said ramipril. Which of them offer the most benefit in terms of remodeling? And how soon do you expect remodeling to happen? AC, AC inhibitors uh, is the most effective, sir, followed by beta blockers and uh, calcium channel blockers. With seven, seven days, Remodeling? Six months, it's, it's in months, not in days. Remodeling, you said it's a chronic process. So, modeling happens over months. Remodeling also happens over months. Right? So, generally, you don't see any effect or benefit till about six months. Okay. And how does it, is it renoprotective? AC renoprotective. It prevents a Renoprotective. So generally, when you talk about 
any cardiovascular disease we also talk about it being an endothelial disorder so it can affect all beds so you should suspect one bed is involved there is a possibility that all beds are cardiovascular all beds are involved including cerebrovascular renovascular right mm -hmm. so idea is that uh, ACE inhibitors would always be protective in these patients. So most patients would receive this, right? If this patient had, uh, had a stormy post-operative course, how soon as an intensivist would you like to see him? Would you, would you be like, willing to see him or would you like the cardiologist to see him? Why I'm asking is, is there any concept of post-critical care clinics that you are aware of? He's, he's under cardiologist or under under you in, in Yashoda? Under Asun, under ICC, you will be there, sir. You will be there, no? Mm -hmm. You should be considering that you know they should visit you also when they come to see the cardiologist okay so how many days doctor uh, how many days would you advise aspirin lifelong in life ticagrelo it uh, in tragedy stent at least for 12 months do you use bare metal stent in um, if if we can't use uh, antiplatelets for at least more than three months uh, or patient is for CABG, then bare metal stent can be a bridge. Okay. So very less commonly. Yes. Yeah. Or else commonly it's a drug eluting stent. And uh, uh, so uh, on the day one you had mentioned you gave I believe 80 milligram atorvastatin Yes, sir. Uh, previously, in previous hospital, they gave 80 eight milligrams. 80. Yes, okay. sir. Loading dose. Why? High, yes. start, high intensity statins, it decreases the uh, um, anti-inflammatory activity and also it uh, prevents the uh, plate migration. Okay, but the mechanism is something else. It's it's a red, it's like a uh, it's an inhibitor of some enzyme, HMG CoA reductase. Huh? So how it is linked with the, uh, inflammation? It main mechanism with it inhibits HMG CoA reductase. It also has additional anti-inflammatory property. So does it have a name? What what effects are they called? We call pleomorphic effects. Is this the last slide? Yes, sir. Patient was discharged. That's good. So, are you aware of implications? Have you seen anything interesting happening in the ICU that you have managed well? post cardiac acute coronary syndromes one patient not this patient not normally after uh, pci one patient had uh, continuous uh, chest discomfort sir. and then mm -hmm. um, patient developed s4b mm -hmm. we uh, we started an niv and the lasix infusion minimal crepes mm -hmm. was there Mm -hmm. and then, um, ECG changes also persisting, sir. Today, I mean, uh, an evaluation, we, start, mm -hmm. we think of uh, re and uh, mm, shifted, to shifted to cat for uh, re revascularization. Okay. So you picked it up? Yes, sir. That's very good. So which is why, you know, the first question or... Uh, one of the questions uh, that Niranjan asked you was hemodynamics unstable post-op or post-PCI. It should always be in your mind. Okay. Could these patients have anemia after these procedures or after these medications are given? 
But this is a drop in hemoglobin. What would you think? Any puncture site uh, hematoma? You should always look at the puncture site, yes. It's a radial axis, all right, but if it had been conventional or uh, you know, non radial, and uh, patients generally have uh, groin axis, it's covered. So you should always look at that to see if there is any hematoma or bleeding from that yeah. side. So these are all things anecdotal, all right, but we have seen all this happening when radial artery was not the yeah. site for uh, access to the left heart or the coronaries. So do bear it in mind. Okay. So again, uh, <clears throat> patients uh, following acute coronary syndrome can have so many various manifestations. So everything that can go wrong can go wrong. So you should always have uh, some somewhere down the line, you mentioned cardiac output monitoring early in our discussion, isn't it? Yes, sir. So what would be the way you monitor cardiac output in the ICU? Stroke volume, stroke volume variation. Okay. Stroke volume variation is uh, and that's that's on on a I I on a Invasive arterial trace or something else? Invasive arterial trace. Okay. Any other forms of cardiac port monitoring that you have used? Generally, we use stroke volume variation for volume replacement, isn't it? You look at volume replacement or whether these patients will take some extra volume. So that was one of the questions or answers for how do you judge whether this patient can receive some extra fluids. So cardiac output monitoring is also an important part that not necessarily for a cardiac patient, could be any other patient. <clears throat> Sepsis, isn't it? So what would be the types of cardiac outputs that the monitoring that can be used in the ICU? Mm -hmm. What what monitors do you have? You have the float you have the flow track device? No. At least theoretically, you know some methods. Litco, Pico, have you heard of all this? Diffusion. Diffusion. Helium. Hmm? DLCO. DLCO, my goodness. What is DLCO? DLCO is nothing to do with cardiac output, isn't it? What is DLCO? CO doesn't always stand for cardiac output. Mm. It is diffusion capacity of Blanco carbon monoxide. Mm -hmm. Okay. DLC is that. So there are, you must read up, okay? <clears throat> Patients with cardiac disease, cardiac output monitoring is one of the forms of advanced monitoring. So some forms you should be aware of. Yes, invasive arterial pressure can give you some indication. <laughs> Echocardiography also you can use for cardiac output monitoring. So pulse contour analysis is something that is so you generally either it's invasive, non-invasive. So we always say no, invasive, non-invasive. Rebreathing, partial rebreathing technique is there if the patient is on ventilator. Please read, all right. Yes. It's an important topic, cardiac output, right? Yes. Anything else, Kalada? Yeah, uh, Niranjan, do you want to ask? Uh, yeah, so uh, Dr. Madhuri, uh, Madhuri ma, so uh, uh, like, is there any guide to manage the cardiogenic shock? Of course, we discuss everything, uh, but there is one objective guide or objective uh, method. 
to manage cardiogenic shock. Algorithm based. Al yeah, al al algorithm based. Mm -hmm. Are you aware of sky staging? Yes. Yeah, you, you must go and read. Okay, so they have staged objectively to cardiogenic shock A to E. Okay, you must be aware at stage A, what need to do? What at B, C, D, E? E is cardiac arrest or like the collapse. Okay, so at what stage the pharmacologic uh, management or the vasopressors and ionotropes should be given? At what stage you need to consider the mechanical circulatory de uh, devices? Uh, once upon IABP was very well preferred, but right now few PSU centers still they prefer. Then comes Impella or VA ECMO. So uh, uh, do not tell LVAD. LVAD is like uh, it's a very costly device that to it, it's operate uh, like it needs surgery to be done. So Impella and VA ECMO these are the two preferred device that is mentioned. Okay, so you must read that thing. Definitely examiners will ask you that thing. So one more thing I uh, I would like to know. So you know, it's a cardiogenic shock. Uh, so, so this is a it's because of the low output state you told. Yes. And norad is a vasopressor. It's not ionotrop. Mm -hmm. You agree? What is the rationale of a vasopressor in cardiogenic shock? If it is not vasodilatory stays, but why the recommendation or the guideline mentions vasopressor is the first preferred pharmacologic agent? They should mention ionotrop. But um, decrease the physiology. Oxygen de to decrease the oxygen demand. What 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 determines coronary perfusion, please? To decrease the oxygen demand. No, no. What what determines coronary perfusion? Coronary blood flow and the supply and demand, sir. And no, no. Uh, among those, if you have a pressure recording, which okay. pressure recordings would help you to determine coronary perfusion? Coronary perfusion is what? What pressure minus what pressure? Pastolic by and yes. minus, minus yes. left ventricular and systolic. <laughs> So, which does this improve? Diastolic. It will improve the left ventricular and diastolic pressure. Diastolic pressure. So, you want the there's a role when you have a block, when you have a patient with stenosis or a thrombus, it's a pressure dependent perfusion. So, unless proximal pressure is maintained, flow is not maintained. Is it somewhere down the line? What happens with thrombolysis, timi through, timi three flow, you said, isn't it? So this is physiological. The vasopressors are, if you increase, if you use an ionotrope, what happens to oxygen supply demand you just mentioned? Ionotrope. Demand, demand will be more. more increased. Yeah. So you will probably be. And this increase or use in conjunction with somewhere down the line again, you said I'll use norepinephrine and dopamine. So, unless you use it in conjunction, just a rhinotrope might not be of a, it might be harmful to the patient. <clears throat> okay. Yes. Are there any questions there? Any, any more, uh, Niranjan? You want to ask anything else? Yeah, no, no, sir. That's all, sir. Someone yeah. has asked. Role of lactate. Yeah. Is that? Hey, Sunil, is that? Sunil is there online? Oh, that's surprising. Sunil, mm -hmm. sir. Sunil Pubani, sir. Yeah, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> he's in India. Sunil, I don't know. He's not a panelist. No, I can't talk to him. Can yes, sir. Uh, he... <clears throat> okay. Anyway, uh, role of lactate, yes, please. Anybody, one of those, uh, one of the students wants to answer in, 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 in this context, in acute coronary. Lactates elsewhere in other forms of shock, yes, but here? 
again anaerobic more anaerobic metabolism demand supply mismatch we can predict lactates might not be a great indicator of it it's a it's an indicator of hypoperfusion organ hypoperfusion which is leading to anaerobic metabolism anaerobic so it's only a state of low cardiac output or cardiac output being low in these patients so might not reflect the status of the cardiovascular system in the sense the heart is at risk here it's not the vascular part actually so it indicates yes low cardiac output state so hypoperfusion again bellamy curve please so please read that organ perfusion is map minus cvp okay so that you should somewhere somewhere about uh, that is very important in these patients all right <clears throat> <clears throat> yeah, for the sake of discussion, so uh, Dr. Madhurima and uh, uh, so uh, can you tell so significance of lactate in all three kind of SOC? So like a septic or a uh, cardiogenic or in hypovolemic shock? Yep. Or, or in which kind of SOC it has more significance or monitoring lactate adds some more Septic shock. Septic shock. So in hypovolemic shock or trauma associated shock, so lactate has more relevance. Unlike so, not so much in sepsis. Definitely, sepsis in sepsis lactate, uh, increasing lactate. Uh, so there will be multiple causes. It's not only the hypoperfusion. Sometimes anaerobic glycolysis can happen because of the inability of the cells to metabolize or maybe because of the hypermetabolism or catabolic state. So there is a comparative analysis in all three kinds of shock. So in hypovolemic shock, lactate monitoring adds more significance to the organ perfusion. Yeah. <clears throat> I think uh... Yeah, that's all, sir. That's all. Yeah, uh, no other uh, much questions, sir. Role of heart uh, fatty acid binding protein, I think. Uh, as a marker, you... yes. As yeah. a marker, biomarker. She has, they have mentioned all the other recent ones also. Yes, sir. Yeah. As a marker. Yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, I think uh, with this, uh, we will come to the conclusion uh, of our webinar, sir. So thank you very much, sir, uh, Gopinath sir, and uh, Dr. Gopinath sir and Dr. Niranjan uh, for giving your valuable insights and sharing the clinical experience on this uh, case. So definitely it got benefited uh, uh, across different students, almost around 100 people logged in. And uh, the viewers, uh, it will go on uh, into thousands uh, over a period of time. So definitely they get benefited. And uh, thank you, Dr. Madhurima and Dr. Tanuja uh, for uh, bringing out this case, uh, which led to uh, a very good uh, discussion. And uh, thank you, Ishoda Hospitals, uh, our digital team and branding team for uh, providing us this platform to uh, continuously conduct uh, the Tuesday webinars from the Department of Critical Care Medicine. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kaladar. Thank you, both of you. Thank I you. think. Uh, thank you. Yes, you have been very confident in the way you have presented and spoken. That's the right approach when you are taking an exam. So, even if you are not very sure, if you are not sure, you should you should also be vocal that you don't know, or rather not sure. Okay, but uh, whatever answers you know, you all spoke very well. Good, keep it up. All right, and practice please, and read a bit of physiology, pharmacology, monitoring. They are all important aspects of critical care. Okay, good. Thank you, Niranjan. Thank you, Kaladar. Thank, Thank you, sir. sir. Thank you, sir. Thank great, you. great learning from us to uh, from you to us also. Yes, sir. Thank you. So kind of you. Take care. Good night. Good night.